my website. Uh, please take a look at all at the exam dates for any foreseeable conflicts. If you have any foreseeable conflicts with the exam of any kind, uh, anything that's already fixed in your calendar, otherwise I'd rather you tell us now uh, and discuss it with us now than uh, suddenly discover it later on. Unforeseeable conflicts, totally different story. We understand that. Um, I tweet about the class periodically, uh, sometimes with useful links. The, the hashtag is, uh, is up there. Any questions from last time? So we're going to slowly train you guys to begin to ask questions so it's not quite so uh, me lecturing at you. And I want to try to, you know, one of the things that's changed since I was here as an undergrad years and years ago is your norms and your generation regarding question asking in lectures has, has evolved to the point where you tend not to do that. Uh, but I would like to help you change that attitude. If, uh, I can, as a teacher, help manage that process so you don't have to worry. If your question doesn't make a lot of sense, I will gently reframe the question and keep going. Uh, and so you don't have to worry about your peers, where you're wasting their time or something like that, or appearing like a gunner or anything like that. If you don't understand something or something is interesting to you, just raise your hand. And, and also, I don't have to call on you, right? Like, I can just keep going if I'm uh, up to something else. So any questions about last time? So I'll be, yeah, oh, Sam has a question. Yes, Sam, thank um, you. A question that I've been asked is, are we going to be putting PowerPoints on Classes V2? Yeah, so we'll be putting the, uh, le thank you. So we'll be putting the lecture notes on Classes V2 always after the lectures and typically every third or fourth or fifth lecture. So in groups, we'll post the slides uh, from the, that's what you meant, the slides, right? So I'll be posting the slides every third or fourth lecture will be posted on, uh, on Classes V2. Okay, so I want to stress that this class is broadly synthetic of the social sciences and medicine, and that it involves both quantitative and qualitative approaches to the topics. And it's going to occasionally involve allusions to biological or mathematical concepts, but there are no prerequisites for the class. So in the next few lectures, where some of these will be more, a bit more prominent, don't be alarmed by, by, uh, by any of them such as they occur. And I have no doubt you can all uh, handle them. Um, all right, so last week we discussed the following things. First of all, using suicide as an initial example, we contrasted personal and collective ways of studying illness, medicine, and death. And we talked about different ways more generally of understanding social phenomena, discussing, for instance, the idea of methodologic individualism and methodological holism. And we described the ways that the practice of medicine differs from the practice of public health. We saw that human lifespans have increased dramatically over the last century, uh, so that, for example, in the last 100 years, women have gone from a life expectancy at birth of roughly 48 years to roughly 80 years. And this, we, this we, we noted, has been an astonishing achievement of human uh, beings, a historic rise in well-being, unparalleled in history before or, or since. We were, at the last lecture, also introduced to the idea of the social patterning of longevity and causes of death. How long you live and what you die for appears to vary not only across time, not only across the last hundred years, but across social categories uh, as well. And we introduce some of the phenomena we'll be discussing later in the class, uh, some other sorts of explanations or axes along which mortality and health and well-being might vary, including the notion of neighborhood effects, institutional effects, and network effects. Now in the course, in this class, we're going to be engaging the implications of the structural opportunities for individuals. And this has been a long-standing topic, a long-standing debate in the social sciences. Does your fate depend on your own choices and actions, or does your fate depend on the structural opportunities and environment around you? And of course, it's neither of those two extremes. It's both. But the extent to which it is both, and our ability to discern the extent to which it is both, and in which domains it is both, and how much it is each or the other, is one of the things we'll be engaging throughout the class. This is the tension between structure and agency. And both, of course, are important, and they're important philosophically and theoretically, but also empirically and pragmatically. So in the case of health, the questions become quite important. What determines individual and population health? Is it the individuals, or is it the environment? And who's responsible for a person's health and a population's health? And these questions, in turn, raise obvious moral and policy questions. And behind all these questions is the question of whether medical care makes any difference at all. Does, the, do, does modern medicine, is modern medicine the primary driver of health and wellness in our society, or is it not? 
Consider this, for example. The United States, the United States spends more on health care than any other country, but it does not have the best outcomes by any stretch of the imagination. For example, if, as of a few years ago, we spent an average of $5,274 per capita on health care, and the British spend less than half of that, about $2,164 per capita, and yet they live longer and have fewer medical problems, even after taking into account differing racial and age compositions of the societies. Now, one of the arguments we'll be making is that while biomedical care might be effective in acute um, and inpatient settings, in chronic disease <coughs> situations and in outpatient settings, it's likely to be, it is, in fact, much less effective. Thus, this kind of focus we have had in our society over the last 20 years on access to medical care as the potential primary driver of well-being might actually be misplaced. It might not be medical care, it isn't, in my judgment, medical care that makes us healthy. So why do we obsess about getting people more access to such care? Because, in fact, it may be people's sociocultural context that's the primary driver of their well-being. And a misappreciation of the extent to, to which these different sorts of phenomena, big medicine or sociocultural factors and public health improvements, a misappreciation of the extent to which those differing phenomena drive health and wellness can then lead to misguided policies. We don't think rationally and clearly about public health policy if we don't really understand the deep and fundamental drivers of health and well-being. And in fact, it's my belief that to improve the health of the population, Physicians must serve as advocates for improved social conditions, public health initiatives, general and health education, and uh, behavioral interventions. Well, just to give you a feel for the sort of outlier the United States is, take a look at this graph. And I didn't bring my pointer today. You don't have to do it, no. Uh, so on the y-axis is life expectancy in years, and on the x-axis is health spending per capita. Uh, and if you look at this, you can see that one of these is not like the others. Uh, as far on the uh, right there is the United States. Uh, and uh, we spend vastly more than any other country, uh, on the, if you look on the x-axis. But on the y-axis, in terms of life expectancy in years, uh, we're no better uh, than any of them. Uh, in fact, if you compare us to England, as shown in those two uh, highlighted dots, you can see the difference. And in fact, you can also think about uh, comparing other comparisons that are instructive. For instance, here's Japan compared to Great Britain. They spend about the same amount of money, uh, and Japan has yet again uh, better health outcomes uh, than the United Kingdom. So understanding and explaining some of these differences will be one of the objectives uh, in this class. And in fact, a recent book by Professor Bradley, the, the master of Brantford College, and Lauren Taylor uh, explores one, one overarching argument to explain this so-called American healthcare paradox. How can it be that we spend so much more than anyone else, it seems, and yet don't have anywhere near as good outcomes as anyone else? Uh, and this slide shows, yet again, the per capita spending across the countries. And we're at the top there of the league table uh, in terms of per capita spending on healthcare, as you can see uh, in the right, uh, as you can see in the far left. But basically, the resolution of the paradox that they advance in the book is that other countries spend more on social supports. That actually, for the OECD countries as a whole, for every $1 spent on health care, they spend about $2 on social services. But in the United States, for every $1 spent on health care, we spend about 55 cents on social services, broadly uh, defined. So what the resolution of the paradox, according to Bradley and Taylor, is, is that while we spend more on health care than other countries, if you instead shift your gaze to look at the total of health care and social well-being spending, actually we spend less than other countries. They spend much more than we do. So here now, if you add the two together, in blue, uh, health care spending, and in red, uh, social services expenditures, you see we fall way down on the table. And maybe this, they argue, is the explanation for this paradoxical finding that we spend so much more but appear not to have as good outcomes. Yeah. In the last lecture, you showed that Japan had the highest life expectancy. Yes. On this graph, Japan, it looks like it spends less than the US. Could you explain that? No, this is just one explanation for the two. There are many other explanations as well. So I don't know where Japan is here. Let's see where it is. Uh, it's that further to the right over there. Yeah. So this isn't the only phenomenon that helps explain these differences. These things aren't going to line up. For example, uh, 
that to take your point to its logical conclusion, what we would, if all that determined health was social support and medical spending, and it was a perfect predictor of life expectancy, then these things should line up in order of life expectancy and correlate perfectly with spending. But if that's not all that drives health. Other things play a role as well. So this, so your point is excellent, your question is excellent, but this data only shows one part of the, one part of the uh, conundrum, which is it helps suggest one of the several reasons why our healthcare spending doesn't match our, um, our longevity rates. Because we spend more on health, but we don't spend as much on other kinds of things as well. Okay, so, um, so total spending on health and social support is indeed higher in many, but not all, as you pointed out, other countries. So it's not healthcare spending that really buys us health, perhaps. And as we introduced the last time, life expectancy, in fact, has changed a lot uh, in the last century. So here on the x-axis is years. You saw this slide the last time. On the y-axis is life expectancy. And here, separately for men and women, the females are in orange and the males are in yellow. And the female lines are above the male lines. Uh, at the solid lines are at the top show life expectancy at birth. 100 years ago, 1900, was about 48 years for women. Come forward 110 years, and women are now living longer than, uh, than 80 years. So very big addition. However, however, the gains at life expectancy at birth are much greater, absolutely, than the gains at life expectancy at age 65. So 100 years ago, if you lived to be 65, both men and women could expect another 12 years. And now, 100 years later, men and women can expect more than they could 100 years ago, but not as much more as they could compared to their uh, life expectancy uh, at birth. So the advances that we have seen in the last 100 years have arisen principally because of improvements in mortality at early ages. The maximum human life expectancy has not changed. So there, may, there can be, we can imagine there is, intrinsic biological constraint on the upper limits of human life, uh, as we discussed last time, and as we'll return to at the very end of the class. Note also the variation by gender here. Women live longer than men. This is something in which women are very fortunate and very privileged, right from the get-go, uh, if you could have one biggest factor that explains well-being in our society, it's being born as a woman. is really great for numerous reasons, one of which is that you get to live uh, so much longer. Um, and this increase in life expectancy, or the conversely framed decrease in mortality, is actually part of a still larger phenomenon known as the health transition that was described in 1971 by Abdel Omran uh, as, as in your readings. So let's talk a little bit about what the health tran uh, transition is. Um, so, so here what we show is on the, on the, y, in, on the x axis in a kind of arbitrary units of year. So we show time on the x axis. And on the y axis we show a number, we show three different uh, outcomes. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in blue is the crude birth rate. The blue line is the crude birth rate, the number of births. Uh, in red is the crude death rate, and in black is the total population, and how they change across four phases of the health transition that are demarcated by the vertical uh, dotted lines. Now I'm going to describe each of them in terms of a typically or typical fully developed country today, such as the United States or Canada, uh, or the countries of Europe, or similar societies elsewhere, such as Japan or Australia. And the time scale here could be anywhere from 50 to 400 years as these societies progress through the phases of the health transition. Now, on stage one, on the far left, this is what we might consider the state of health in societies in pre-modern times. And it's characterized by a balance between birth rates and death rates. So you see the red and the blue lines roughly overlap. And, uh, and then the, the, uh, the population is relatively low and steady across time. It's sort of a flat line in that first phase that's seen in the far left uh, over there. And this was true of all human populations on the planet until the 18th century. Everywhere on the planet, this was, there were human populations, they had high birth rates, high death rates, and low and steady, low population size, and low, if any, population growth. That is to say, the population size was steady uh, across time. And this balance was broken in the 18th century uh, in, uh, in Northern Europe, um, in, in Northern and Western uh, Europe. Uh, and at that time, 
prior to this break, breaking, birth and death rates were both very high, about 30 to 50 per thousand. And this approximate balance between birth and death rates resulted in very slow population growth across, across time. And over much of prehistory, uh, beginning uh, since the agricultural revolution uh, about 10,000 years ago, population growth on the world, on the whole planet, has been incredibly low, about 0.05% per year, resulting in doubling times for human populations on the order of one to 5,000 years. So for millions of years, it took one to 5,000 years for uh, human populations to double in size. And this is known as the high stationary stage of population growth in terms of high birth rates and death rates, and they're stationary, those rates, and they're stationary total population. And death rates were very high at all times in the stage for a number of reasons, including a lack of knowledge about disease prevention and cure, occasional food shortages, and the impact of all kinds of extrinsic causes of death, like accidents and diseases. So stage one, the pre-modern stage, uh, social economic development is one plus in the upper, upper part there of the chart. Life expectancy at birth is about 30 years, and diseases are weighted towards acute, infectious, nutritional, and accidental causes of death. That's what human populations looked like until a couple hundred years ago. Next, we have stage two, which comes right to the right. And what begins to happen here is societies begin to industrialize. There's a rise in population, the black line begins to rise, that's caused by a decline in the death rate while the birth rate remains high. So the red death rate is declining. People start to start living longer, but the birth rate remains high, as shown in the blue line. And this, of course, causes population uh, growth. And this decline in death rate in Europe began in the late 18th century in northwestern Europe and spread over the next 100 years to the south and east. And this is obviously historically very recent. And this decline in death rate is due initially to two factors. First, there are improvements in the food supply as agricultural practices were improved in the 18th century. People invented or began to deploy crop rotation, uh, selective breeding, and seed technology. And another food-related practice was the discovery of, uh, of new world foodstuffs like corn and potatoes that were then brought back to Europe. And these new crops increased the, quality of, the quantity and quality of food in the European diet. Um, and second, there were significant improvements in public health that reduced mortality, particularly in childhood, that are taking place at this time. So it's not so much medical breakthroughs that are driving the death rate down at this period in time. Rather, it was things like improvement in the water supply, in sewage, in food handling, and in general personal hygiene following on from growing scientific knowledge of the causes of disease. In fact, increased female literacy aligned with public health education programs probably also played a role. So knowledge is advancing. People are discovering how we might reduce mortality, not because of biomedical advances, because in fact, at that period of time, there wasn't much doctors could actually do to, to forestall death. But there were things that people were learning how to do to reduce the force of mortality. Those things were being implemented. Death rate is declining. Birth rate is still high. Population begins to go up. And a consequence of this decline in mortality is an increase, increasingly rapid rise in population growth or a population explosion. And this growth is not due to an increase in fertility because, as we said, birth rates remain relatively stable. But one other consequence of these changes is a change in the age structure of populations. So what's happening is that increasingly, the population is becoming more youthful. Babies are surviving. People are living older, more babies are being produced, uh, and we get a change in the age structure of the population. So here in the second stage, socioeconomic development, we give the two plus life expectancy at birth is going to about 30 to 50. <coughs> now we get to stage three, a kind of mature industrial society. And what happens that's important in the third stage is that birth rates now begin to decline. Whereas formerly the blue line was high, now it begins to go down uh, as well. And there's several factors that are contributing to this decline, most of which are quite speculative. We still don't fully understand why did people start having fewer babies during this period of time. In rural areas, one of the possible explanations is that as fewer babies died, parents began to realize eventually that they didn't require so many children to be born to ensure a comfortable old age. 
So one argument is that people just rationally began producing fewer children. Another possibility is that increases in wealth may have delayed marriage, which in turn reduced fertility. People became richer, they got married later as a result of that uh, in, a change, and then because they got married later, ultimately had lower total fertility. Increasing urbanization and changes in traditional values uh, placed upon fertility and on the value of children also may have played a role. So as, as, as urbanization rises, the, uh, the whole society, the culture, begins to change. And urban living also raises the cost of dependent children to a nuclear family, in, 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 uh, especially when laws begin to be passed that prohibit child labor uh, and so forth. And finally, increased female literacy and employment may uh, probably lower the uncritical acceptance of childbearing and motherhood as measures of status in women. And this also may have contributed to lower uh, birth rate. Uh, contraceptive technology played a very small role. It was very late in the process. It's not that women are using contraception, and that's what's happening. Now, at some point, late in stage three, the birth rate now falls back down to match the death rate. But in stage four, the birth rate and death rate again match each other, just like they did in stage one. But and the population has sort of plateaued, as you can see the black line. But now they flipped, the, two, the sets of lines have flipped completely uh, from the first stage. This stage, stage four, is also characterized uh, by stability, uh, but it is, um, but it is uh, not the, uh, not the um, high stationary phase, but rather the low stationary phase uh, over here. Uh, and the population age structure has become older, life expectancy is now greater than 70, socioeconomic development gets four pluses, and now the diseases have shifted from kind of chronic diseases in the mature industrial to kind of mental disorders, right, uh, in kind of contemporary era in the post-industrial uh, society. Um, and there can be other changes as well. For instance, we begin to see the practice of female infant, of uh, sort of uh, uh, preferential abortion of female fetuses with the deployment of new technologies, you know, uh, ultrasound technologies and the like, prenatal diagnosis. So it's not just age structure that's changing, but the sex structure can also begin to change because these technologies are being used. Now, I seriously doubt that there will be a fifth stage to the right, with the question mark there, which we might think of as the age of immortality. Though, as we'll see at the end of this course, some believe that there can be a kind of human-machine fusion, which might contribute to a kind of fifth stage that we're on the cusp of a kind of completely different transformation of humanity where we come to take machines into us or fuse with machines in a kind of cyborg existence which we'll return to later in the class. But the fourth stage really does involve a delay in disease and certain other features including an increase in mental illness and a phenomenon known as medicalization as we'll see in just a moment. So in summary, as socioeconomic development proceeds, Mortality and fertility rates shift from high to low rates. Populations get larger and older. And the disease patterns shift from one dominated by infectious disease, perinatal diseases, <coughs> nutritional disorders, and accidents to one dominated by chronic disease and mental disorders. So that's a summary of the health transition. And in the broadest possible sense, sets the stage for some of the ideas we're going to be discussing in the class with respect to the relative import of advances in medicine versus socioeconomic changes as the primary drivers of health and well-being. And this increasing life expectancy is mirrored by a changing composition of causes of death. <coughs> for example, cancer has been increasing in the dark blue shown here, and influenza and pneumonia, uh, shown in a different color in the sort of light blue, uh, have been decreasing over time. So if you look across the last 100 years or so at the, what the causes of death have been, as of we've already begun to introduce in the class, that composition is changing as well, as well. So people are living longer. They're dying of different things. But the question is, are we the better for it? And this is an important question we haven't considered yet. If I told you that you could live to be 70 and then die, or you could live to be 70 and then spend five years in a coma or in agony and then die at 75, which would you prefer? Who would like to live to be 70 and then die? Raise your hands. Who would like to live to be 70 and then spend five years in a coma or in agony and then die? So it matters, actually, what the quality of life is, right? It's not just length of life, 
we need to consider something else as well if we're really going to understand whether these increases in longevity actually have improved human well-being in some kind of material way. So the question is, are we living better when we live longer? And Fries, in the classic paper from 1980, that's in your readings, outlines three possibilities. So on the top, he draws a little cartoon of the present mortality. You're born on the far left. And at age 55, you have a kind of a morbidity. That means an illness. Something is wrong. Uh, and then the morbidity increases across time. And then you die at age 76. So one thing that may have happened in the last 100 years in our society is this life extension idea. People might still fall ill at 55, but because things are done to them, like medical care, they might live longer after they're diagnosed. So they might live, instead of living, dying at 76, they might live to be 80. That's one possible thing that might have happened. Another possible thing is shift to the right. Here, because of something that's happened in our society, the onset of illness is postponed from 55 to 60. People, though, still live, uh, whatever it is, 21 years, and now die at 81. So there's a whole kind of shift to the right that's taken place is another possibility. The duration how, of the time that you're in a bad state has stayed the same. It's not longer like in life extension. Uh, but, uh, but it's been postponed. And a fourth possibility that Fries suggested was this compression of morbidity idea. And in this thing, idea, what's happening is the onset of illness has been postponed, and the timing of death has been postponed, but the first has been postponed more than the other. So we live longer, but we also, good news, spend less time sick and ill and disabled. Now this compression of morbidity is a good thing in and of itself. And it also has, because it's good, as it, I mean, it's a measure of well-being, but it also has policy, policy benefits in and of itself because it offsets the effects of population aging and offsets the consequences of having an increasing number of elderly who need medical care. So if we have a compression of morbidity, this is good news because it means that although people are getting older, they're, they're more often still fit. So that's good news for our uh, society, for example. And Cutler, in your readings, notes that over the last few decades, life expectancy and the number of elderly in our society have greatly increased, but the number of people in nursing homes has remained constant or declined. And this, he argues, is indirect evidence for the compression of morbidity hypothesis. Now, when Fries suggested this idea in 1980 uh, that there could be a compression of morbidity, it was far from clear that there would be. And data to test this idea at the population level were very limited. Since then, however, we do have such data, such as this graph showing estimates that are based on the National Long-Term Care Survey, also taken from your reading. And there has been a dramatic drop in disability over the last 20 years at roughly the rate of 2% per year, which is greater than the decline in mortality in the same time period, which is 1% per year. So this is a percent disabled. This is trends in disability across time. It's declining faster than mortality is declining. So people are living longer. They're dying of different things. And they are healthier while we live. All three of these things are happening. Now, any questions about that? OK. So now, when we speak about disability, morbidity, and, and health, uh, we seem to assume that we all mean the same thing and that we know what we mean. But even this seemingly simple thing of defining health is not so simple. There are, in fact, many ways to define it. And one way to define health is simply as the absence of disease. But this standard relies on the failure to detect a disease. It's a negative definition that relies on instruments to detect disease. And it also simply shifts the problem of defining health to one of defining disease. But another way, and a very important way, of defining health is the statistical standard, which compares people to the population. So the statistical standard says that diseases of living organisms are internal states which interfere with normal functioning of these organisms. What is to be considered normal, or what is to be considered normal functioning, is calculated statistically with respect to an age group of a sex of a species. So in this situation, you imagine a kind of histogram of wellness. Uh, and then you just draw a line, and you say, OK, people that are to the right of that line are well. 
and we're going to say people to the left of that line are sick. They're abnormal. They are not normal, statistically speaking. So by this definition, missing a kidney at birth, probably at least one, maybe two of you in this classroom right now, whether you know it or not, are missing a kidney. Some of you probably know it. I won't ask you to raise your hands. Uh, or, um, uh, or being colorblind, surely a, a significant fraction of you, five or six of you will be colorblind, most of the guys, uh, will be colorblind are, uh, as disease states. Right, so by this definition, missing a kidney or colorblind, that's abnormal, statistically speaking, that's a disease state. But here's another definition. Another alternative definition of health is the adaptation standard. And in this definition, the states of health or disease are the expressions of the success or failure experienced by the organism in its efforts to respond adaptively to environmental challenges. And the adaptation standard compares people to their surroundings. It stresses the performance of the organism in its physical, biological, and social environment. It focuses on the ability of an organism to perform given its situational background or its standard circumstances. So this sunburned man, who appears to also be deprived of IQ points and to have deliberately done this to himself, is a very poor fit with his high sun environment and might benefit from killing an older sibling. Um, <laughs> now more to the point, missing a kidney would not be maladaptive or reflective of, of ill health in this, by this definition, right? You can function just fine with one kidney. After all, people often donate their kidneys to other people. There's nothing maladaptive, by and large, about having a single kidney. So in other words, the standard circumstances can vary across time and place and from society to society. As a result, a person with a particular physical or mental constitution may be able to fit in one environment and not in another, and may be judged unhealthy in one place and not in another. So disability can be seen as a failure of adaptation. If your hip is decrepit and I replace it with an artificial hip, you are no longer disabled. But what if I give you a motorized wheelchair? Is that the same? Have I cured you when I give you a motorized wheelchair? And by this definition, the answer would be yes. It shouldn't make a difference whether I replace your hip or give you a wheelchair. In fact, you could say that I've equally restored you to health in both conditions. And if you are deaf, you might ask, are you unhealthy? Uh, and then with a hearing aid, have you been rendered healthy? Does that technology cure you of your illness? And now we can speak of you as being healthy. Actually, one can get quite serious about the sunburn example. Here's what happens when you take a fair-skinned set of people and move them to an environment near the equator. This shows the incidence of melanoma, which is the most serious kind of skin cancer, and it's quite deadly if it's not treated early, in countries around the world. And Australia and New Zealand have the highest rates in the world, by far, of this deadly condition. But the aboriginal people of Australia do not suffer from melanoma. Now, it's not just physical aspects of the environment, such as sunlight, that matter. Biological aspects also might be important and might be relevant to the fit between the individual and their environment. So for historically, for example, Native Americans were just fine in terms of some aspects of their health until the environment changed with the introduction of Europeans and their old world infections. Epidemics of pathogens, such as smallpox or measles, raged through the population and decimated it. Here is one estimate of the population decline uh, in the population of Native Americans in Mexico from 1518 to 1593. Over a course of 80 years, over 90% of the people died, uh, 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 going from 25 million people in 1518 to 2 million people in 1593, much of it simply attributable to infection. So they were fine until the, the biological environment changes and they're wiped out in less than a century uh, in this population. And here on the right is a 500-year-old drawing of um, a de uh, depicting uh, Navajo Native Americans suffering from smallpox, very clearly understood and described by the people uh, at the time. Similar things happening north of the border, north of the contemporary border. This is among the, uh, this is known as the Columbian Exchange, this idea of the introduction of infections from uh, the old world to the new world. Um, 
This is uh, among the Illinois Indian population uh, about a century later, uh, estimated population on the x on the y axis, year on the x axis, very similar kind of dramatic decline, primarily due to infection. Now, a third way of defining health is as follows. This is the social standard. And what we might say here is the following. In some ways, disease does not exist until we have agreed it does by perceiving, naming, and responding to it. This social value standard compares people to ideals and ideas. How can disease exist until we detect, define, and name it? For example, prior to the antibiotic era, having the sequelae of infection, such as pockmarked skin, was normal and was not de deemed to reflect a disease process at all. Everyone had pockmarked skin. There was nothing abnormal about that. It was only when we decided that it was abnormal that it became abnormal, became to be seen as a disease. Or think about high blood pressure, which all of you take for granted as a disease. Until the sphingomanometer, a blood pressure cuff, was invented about 100 years ago, nobody knew what your blood pressure was. There was no way to think of hypertension as a condition until we invent a technology and define this as a disease by saying, oh, an elevation in this number means there's something wrong with you. So missing a kidney or color blindness in this scenario are only diseases if we say so. Now there may also be a kind of so-called culture-bound syndromes. Culture-bound syndromes comprise several kinds of illness or affliction, all of which are defined as culture-bound in that they do not have a one-to-one -one correspondence with the disorder recognized by Western allopathic biomedicine and that these conditions often have obscure biological origins. And in fact, they're often initially reported as confined to a particular culture or a set of related or geographically proximal cultures. Now, these so-called culture-bound syndromes pose somewhat greater conceptual problems. One example is a condition known as susto in Latin America, which is an illness attributed to a frightening event that causes the soul to leave the body, leading to symptoms of unhappiness and sickness. Or another uh, disease is no, in, typically seen in Malaysia and in certain parts of Southeast Asia no, is known as koro, which is an episode of sudden and intense anxiety that the penis, or in rare female cases, the vulva and the nipples, will recede into the body and possibly uh, disappear and cause death. And the treatment of this condition is to assign a trusted family member the job of holding the penis 24 hours a day to make sure that it doesn't have this catastrophic uh, movement. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's easy for us to look at that, and, and there are actually epidemics of coral. Uh, it's known as Suiyang, uh, Suiyang in China, and there have been uh, epidemics of coral, outbreaks of coral occur in this part of the world, and also are rarely seen in the United States uh, and Europe. Now, it's easy to look at susto or coral and say, oh, that doesn't make any sense. Look at those crazy people over there with this crazy idea that the penis is going to disappear into the body and someone's to hold it all the time, and you know, Jesus. Uh, but actually, there are other people who could look at our society and make similar kinds of statements. For example, back pain in the, in the, in the, uh, in the West has very wi widely varying rates, but its biological origins are very obscure. We don't fully understand the origins of back pain, and yet it's one of the most common disabling conditions in working American males. They complain of back pain, uh, but we really can't figure out what the problem is. So people might look at that and say, that makes no sense from our perspective. Some have suggested that anorexia, which is the severe restriction of food intake associated with a morbid fear of obesity and sometimes involving other methods of weight loss such as excessive exercise or, uh, or medications, also can be seen as a culture-bound syndrome. Anorexia is really not known outside of uh, educated, uh, well, not educated, uh, typically wealthy, educated, uh, sort of developing world, developed world populations. So this is one of the things we mean when we say that a disease is socially constructed. This definition, an idea we'll also return to later. So to recap, we've considered four possible types of definitions. The first is the absence of disease, which just defines health by reference to its opposite. But this just says what health is not, and one would still need the norm normality, adaptation, or social standards anyway. <coughs> So the statistical standard compares people to the population of their peers. The adaptation standard compares people to their environment. 
and the social standard compares people to ideals and ideas. Four different possible definitions. And there's actually one other more official definition. This is the WHO definition of health. The WHO definition is that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So any questions on this stuff? <clears throat> So, um, and there's still other possible definitions of health that could be offered. There's the health as happiness definition, the welfare theory of health, and still others. But this definition is important because it implies obligations on patients, doctors, and society. Is health a personal or a communal good? And how can it be measured? This connection of health to happiness and to complete well-being is important for both conceptual, conceptual and methodological reasons in part because it's related to the concept of utility. So what is utility? Utility refers to the happiness or satisfaction gained consuming goods and services or from being in a certain state. People are construed as rationally trying to maximize their utility and rationally trying to be as well off as possible. And also, the more utility that people have, the less difference an additional amount of utility makes. There's diminishing marginal utility. So if you're very happy and well off, it's much more difficult to improve you by a certain amount of, of happiness and well-being than if you're less happy and well off. Now measuring this idea of utility as a kind of proxy measure for health, uh, or measuring happiness, is quite complicated actually and quite tricky. Because utility is supposed to be a summary measure of everything we care about. It is thus an expression of our values. Now, many social scientists take a rather behavioristic view of utility. They say it's a hypothetical construct that accounts for observed choices. In a bit of reasoning that, to me at least, borders on tautological, they sometimes argue that people are rational maximizers of their own utility. And so, by definition, whatever people do necessarily maximizes their utility. They say, oh, people always want to maximize their utility, therefore any choice they make must be rationally seen as maximizing that. So even choices that to you and me might seem to be crazy choices, we must consider that they have done it for a reason. Their choice, their revealed preference, uh, tells us something about the utility they derive from whatever it is that they happen to be doing. I don't agree with that position. I rather leave open the possibility that choices do not maximize utility very well at all. I actually think that judgments by individuals and by others outside them are at least as relevant as decisions and actions. So how do we measure utility or health more generally? Proper research and understanding trends in disability and health and in quality of life requires a kind of specification of what we mean and how to measure it. So when we're talking about health, and as we continue to talk about health, what, what, how, what exactly do we mean? Well, a very obvious thing to measure is death. Now, death is a great thing to measure. It's by and large, indisputable if the person is dead or alive. It's typically really easy to discern uh, death and collect such statistics. And many of the things we'll be looking at involve measures of death when we speak of health. Uh, IMR's infant mortality rate or life expectancy and so forth. We could also have physical measures that involve tests or examinations. We could measure things in terms of disability, your performance status, what are you able to do, or so-called ADLs, your activities of daily living, or your grip strength, for example, we might measure as a proxy for your health. Or we could, excuse me, rely on people's self-reports. We could ask you, rate your health on a five-point scale. Turns out, actually, that's pretty good uh, when you ask people to do that. Or we could measure symptoms. We could ask you, are you in pain? Are you depressed? Do you have blood in your urine? Uh, those are kinds of things we could just ask you. Or we could give you little vignettes to read and say, you know, how, do your, how does your health compare to this little hypothetical vignette that I've given you? Or we could do three other somewhat more quantitative things known as the standard gamble, the time trade-off method, or use something known as visual analog scales. Now in all of these things, we have to ask the question of what do we care about? I mean, are we interested in subjective or objective experience of health? And what if there's inconsistency between the two? Should we privilege people's own perspectives like when you tell me, you say you're healthy, but I say there's blood in your urine. You say, I'm in agony, and I say, I can't measure anything. Which of those do we privilege, your subjective experience 
or the, quote, objective standard that we somehow uh, use to assess you? Do we use the social or statistical standards? And why should we care about any of these things? In fact, there's also the question of whose <coughs> values matter. Do we derive assessments of health states from people who have them or people who do not? From the young or from the old, from the rich or the poor? And it can actually matter quite a bit. Consider whether we want to know how bad it is to have to walk with a cane. Assessing how bad depends on whether we ask young people or old people. If you ask a young person how much disutility is there of walking with a cane, they'll give us a different answer than if we ask an old person. So it's not objective. It depends on who the person is that's experiencing this adverse health state of having to walk with a cane. And in fact, we have to ask the question, how do we measure utility or health more generally? Proper research and understanding trends in disability and health and quality of life requires some specification of what we mean and how we measure it. So let's look a little bit at these uh, in some detail. So how many of you have played the would you rather game? Would you rather have sex with Ernie or Bert, for instance? <laughs> Raise your hand if it's Ernie. How about Bert, one guy for Ernie? Okay, Bert? <laughs> well, you have to pick, you can't, okay. That's the whole point. Would you rather have sex with Ernie or Bert? Uh, be eaten by ants or by lions? Ants. Raise your hands by ants. Raise your hands by lions. <laughs> be able to fly or read other people's thoughts. Be three feet tall or nine feet tall. Drool frequently and uncontrollably or be a bedwetter. <laughs> I won't ask you that one. Have to always eat standing up or always enter your car from the back of the door. <laughs> Hate your life, but be popular, or love your life, but be despised. Uh, and in fact, you can go to a website to play such games. You know, would you rather live in a world where there are no problems, or live in a world where you rule? <laughs> I can answer this one for me. How many of you would rather live in a world where there are no problems? Live in a world where you rule? <laughs> or would you rather be the smartest person, you know, or the hottest person? Raise your hands if you'd rather be the smartest, hottest. <laughs> so, actually, this would you rather game has been used by scientists in a rather convincing uh, uh, way you to, in something known as the standard gamble. So how does the standard gamble work? Well, this is a way of measuring the utility of a health state. Let's say you wanted to measure the intrinsic healthiness of state A or its utility. You want to get a sense of, well, how bad is it, or good is it to be in state A? So you would give people a choice. You would give to them a choice. You would say, would you rather have choice A or choice B? Okay? In choice A, they're instantly transported to health state A. You say for them, you're going to be made depressed, or you're going to make you blind, or we're going to make you uh, be on dialysis right away. Alternatively, you could make a different choice. You could choose B. In choice B, one of two things is going to happen. Either, either, with probability P, you're going to be in perfect health, which we give a utility of 1, or with probability 1 minus P, you're going to be put to immediate death. And so now I ask you, which of these two would you want? Would you rather be blind, or would you rather have a 10% chance of dying? Get the idea? Would you rather be blind, or have a 5% chance of dying? Would you rather be blind, or have a 2% chance of dying? And I vary that probability, and I see at what point a sample of people are neutral in the would you rather game in the choice of the two. And when I do that, I can define the utility of health state H as the, as, as, as the probability P. Because when you're neutral to the two choice, the two branches must be equal to each other. So the use of H, the utility of health state H, must be equal to the probability of the choice of utility 1, which is P, times uh, uh, 1 minus P times 0, which is death, which is the worst state. So it's shown in the lower left, I don't have my pointer. Uh, that probability that I chose gives the definition of the utility of the state. Now, um, is this clear? Is this little, way, this little game clear? Can anyone see any problems with this approach? Why might this not be such a good way to do it? Yeah. Sorry, say that again? Like, um, if you 
excellent point. So what she's saying is that actually there could be a kind of design problem here depending on how we frame choice B. So we can frame choice B as either you have a 10% chance of immediate death or you have a 90% chance of perfect health. And that that little design detail might change some of the outcome a little bit. Yes. But let's assume you do it, you do it like by always framing it in the positive way. You've got a 90% chance of health. Yeah, in the back. Is it possible to know how you deal in a situation you've never been in? Excellent. So it turns out if you play this game with people that have one kidney, they would actually give you no probability of immediate death to, uh, to be spared the fate of having one kidney. But if you play this game with people who don't lack, who have two kidneys, they'll say, well, yeah, actually, I'll take a small risk of death to avoid lacking a kidney. Do you see? And similarly, if you ask blind people to play this game, they might give, make a very small accommodation to avoid being blind. Whereas the rest of us would say, no, I'll take a higher probability of death. Do you see? So the utility assigned to the state will vary according to who uh, uh, are very sensitive to the uh, respondent state. Other possible problems with using this measure, this way of assessing a utility. Yeah? Depending on your uh, religious views or whatever, some people might be more scared of death than others. Yeah, so it's possible that different people have different aversions to death. Right, so actually we define this utility of death as, you know, death is zero, but some of us might not have death as zero, it might be 0 0.1. You know, I think I'm going to heaven, uh, so actually death isn't so bad for me uh, as it is for you. More generally, there could be other kinds of problems. For instance, the numeracy, you have to be quite numerate to play this game, right? You guys can all play this game, you're all Yaleys, but actually people who are not Yaleys might not be able to play this game. If you are Harvard, for example, you have difficulty with this game. <laughs> Um, or there could be other kinds of issues that this is very abstract. You have to think about it, this health in a very abstract way in order to elicit utilities in this fashion. Here's another way of assigning a utility to a state, uh, again measured as u sub h. Here this is called the time trade-off method. On the y-axis we have the health status of different states, and on the x-axis we have time. And we imagine that you can be in perfect health for some amount of time t1. Or we say you can be in some lesser state of health, u sub h, and we vary the time t2 until you're neutral to the 2. We say either you can be in perfect health for 10 years, or you can be blind for 20. Which of those would you pick? Oh, blind for 15. Which of those would you pick? Etc. You can either uh, be in perfect health for 10 years, or have severe arthritis uh, for 12 years. Are you neutral to that choice? And we ping pong back and forth and vary the time until you get to the point of neutrality, the panel of judges. And then by using the equation shown in the upper right, and you can probably intuit how and why it works, that the product of 1 times t must equal the product of uh, h times t2, that that actually will give you a measure of u sub h. Clearly, if t sub 2 is less than t sub 1, uh, that t1 would dominate, the, would be above the frontier. So if t2 becomes less, no one would pick I would rather be have arthritis for eight years or perfect health for 10 years, right? You wouldn't pick uh, more, a shorter, more disabled life over a longer, uh, perfectly healthy life. So, you, for example, the way in practice you do this is you tell people, imagine you're age 50, you have severe arthritis, you're unable to walk, you're in constant pain, you must choose between living with arthritis until age 80 or living in perfect health for a shorter length of time, and you ping pong back and forth until an, an amount of time is chosen. If the age selected is 75, you do the little bit of arithmetic that's shown there, and the utility of the arthritic state in this example comes out of 0.83. And the utility is also 1 minus the number of years willing to give up divided by 80, which uh, minus the current age. And the better the proposed health state is, the fewer the years you would give up uh, to be in that state. And visual analog scales are among the most frequently used measures, uh, measurement scales in healthcare research. The visual analog scale is most commonly known and used uh, for measurements of pain. Uh, you ask people, where would you put arthritis, for example, uh, with diverse uh, possible uh, poles? So you might say, no pain at all or well on the left, worst possible pain or death, dead on the right. And you ask people to put an X what do you think about this state, being in severe arthritis? Put an X where you think that falls. And you get a lot of people to do that, and then you just measure, literally measure, the length along the line, and you use that as the uh, utility. Um, so you get people to put a line somewhere, and they can put it, or you can use these other kinds of, uh, kind of uh, cartoon images to assess people's, uh, the disutility of a particular state. And here's some illustrative utilities obtained from these types of measurements. 
So for example, perfect health is one. Mild angina, which is some pain associated with the heart, uh, is a 0.9. A kidney transplant is 0.84. Severe arthritis, 0.83. Being on lifelong dialysis. Raise your hands if you know someone that's on lifelong dialysis. Yeah, so actually being on lifelong dialysis is, you know, having kidney failure is very common in our society. Most of you probably have never noticed that in many malls in our society, there are little tiny shop fronts that are dialysis centers. And in many parts of our community, there are little tiny places. If your kidneys don't work, three days a week for four hours or so, you have to go and sit in a chair and be connected to a machine that cleans your blood. So imagine those machines must be everywhere. Maybe never thought about this before. Because people with dialysis needs don't get dialyzed at home unless they're incredibly wealthy. Usually they have to go somewhere. And they don't go to hospitals to be dialyzed three times a week. They go to these kinds of places. And if they travel around our country, they do that. They go from one place to another. Everywhere in the country, there are dialysis units where people go and are dialyzed. And so being in lifelong dialysis is seen to be almost as bad, half as bad, or 40% of the way to being dead. People think, wow, to be have my kidneys not worked, have all the complications of renal failure, which are many, and also to have this unpleasant reality of having to be dialyzed every two days and spend half a day in the dialysis unit, I don't like that. Uh, depression uh, is, uh, is even worse. Uh, then we have blindness and deafness. Permanent hospitalization is one third as good as being fully healthy, and dead is zero. Now, interestingly, when people develop the scale, they imagine that there couldn't be states worse than death. But when they went out to real human beings and asked them to do these kinds of tests, they often would say, well, actually, being bedbound and in severe pain is worse than death. I want negative numbers, they said, which this whole system doesn't allow. We can't imagine states worse than death in this system. Or if you were in a persistent vegetative state, which means that um, basically you're a vegetable, your mind isn't working, but you're alive, your heart's working. I had many patients like that when I, I used to take care of patients. Uh, you know, is a state worse than death. There are, most of us would not want to be in that state if we had the choice. We would rather uh, be dead. Now, one way you could use these utilities or health measures might be as follows. So imagine now on the y-axis is the health and the utility of the state. On the x-axis is time. And we trace out the life course of two different patients, in blue and in gray. So the first patient starts at 1, has some kind of health event, has a heart attack, and steps down maybe gets a kidney trans needs a kidney transplant and gets it and improves and traces out the kind of state that's shown uh, in gray. And the blue patient traces out the blue uh, course of action and then dies at some later point in time. If we compare the two patients just by length of life, shown in the upper right, we might say that an administration of medical care to the gray patient to make their life like the blue patient uh, gives this many years of life gain. But that's an incomplete picture of the health improvements that have accrued to that individual. It's not just about length of life. In fact, we see that the quality of life is, throughout life is much better in the blue patient than in the gray patient. So this is the idea of quality adjusted life years, which takes into account both the quantity and the quality of life generated by healthcare interventions. A quality places a weight on time in different health states. And a year of perfect health is worth one, but a year in less than perfect health uh, is worth less than one. And qualities provide a common currency to assess the extent of the benefits gained from a variety of interventions in terms of health-related quality of life and survival um, of the patient. Any questions about this? OK. Now, all of the things I've just told you are actually kind of annoying. I mean, they kind of bug me because they're these really thinned out versions of life experience. These very technocratic, kind of quantitative, trying to compare apples to oranges, you know, is a loss of a kidney, is a loss of an ear worse than a loss of an eye? You know, it's kind of very mechanistic, simplified, thinned out version of human uh, experience. They are what we might think of as thin measures of health. And here's what a thick description, to borrow Clifford Geertz's famous phrase, of a health state might be like taken from uh, medical anthropologist Arthur Kleiman's work, a, a wonderful book called The Illness Narratives. So here, here now is a different way of seeing what health is like. Alice Alcott is a 46-year-old patient with lifelong diabetes and now with a new onset of heart disease and angina. And here is how she describes her state. How was I going to live with this limitation? 
What a burden I would be on my family and friends. I feared becoming the town invalid. I was terribly guilty. I had felt all along that my illness had interfered with my relationship to my children. I never had enough time to give them. I was more preoccupied with myself than with their problems. I was in the hospital at critical times for them. Now I would be nothing but a burden. As far as my husband goes, the guilt was worse. After the chest pain, I feared having sexual relations with him. We became celibate. The claudication, that's pain in the legs due to constraints in the blood supply, similar to pain in the heart, uh, which is heart attack or angina, uh, due to constraints of blood supply to the heart. The claudication, the angina, they interfered with the things we loved. Long walks in the country, birding, climbing, sports. I had to become self-centered in order to control my condition. I felt like a survivor. All I was good for was hanging on. This is a completely different description than these little time trade-offs and little would you rather have sex with Bert and Ernie uh, kind of uh, games that we just saw a moment ago, right? This is the woman's real uh, experience. And notice also how in the description of her health, just like the suicide notes we saw the last time, she's talking about her relationships to others, right? Her health experience, her experience of health has a lot to do with her relationship with her children, with her husband, with sex, with sports, with hiking, with all these other things, none of which are captured by the measures that we just saw. And in fact, this person values the, her health, values the way or assesses the way her health is affecting <coughs> others, which is also covered in the Cutler readings for today. And this type of description highlights a good question. Isn't, isn't it to this, this type of experience, that doctors should orient themselves, taking care of this sort of suffering, rather than somehow orienting themselves to adjusting the quality level, right? If you want to be a doctor, probably 25% of you do, the question for yourselves is, are you gonna be managing the person's qualities, or are you gonna be responding to this experience? And I'm actually not taking a position on this. I'm just highlighting the tension between these different ways of appreciating and approaching health. And a final aspect that I would like to note about the state of health in the modern era that we alluded to at the beginning of the lecture today is that of medicalization. And medicalization involves the following. It, and we'll return to this next week. It involves seeing doctors for progressively less serious conditions. For example, I probably shouldn't ask you this, but probably many of you went to see doctors for acne when you were in high school. You know, 100 years ago, this would have been seen as ridiculous, right? For physicians, well, actually, many physicians did take care of that. But the point is that increasingly these are seen as medical problems, these sort of trivial conditions, you know, or, or hair loss, you know, treatment for hair loss in men, you know, with Rogaine, for example. So medicalization, we increasingly see doctors for progressively less serious conditions. Medicalization also involves seeing doctors for non-medical conditions or the redefinition of such conditions as to be under the purview of doctors. So road rage becomes a medical condition, for example. Or finally, seeing doctors for normal parts of life experience. And many would argue, for example, that there are many things that we see doctors for today that actually, when you pause, you think, well, that's just a normal part of life. Why are we seeing doctors for that particular kind of problem? And in fact, many studies of why people go to doctors suggest that many, if not the majority, of outpatient visits by patients in the United States to their physicians do not result in a specific diagnosis let alone a serious illness being uh, detected at all. So people may be healthier by many of the measures we've considered for the last two classes, but may not feel so good on other measures. And here's a list of some conditions that have recently been medicalized. We understand all of these things increasingly in medical terms, whereas formerly we may have understood them as non-medical problems. So premenstrual syndrome, for example, has been medicalized. Erectile dysfunction. Now it's like the sphingomanometer. Remember earlier in the class today we said, actually, until we invented blood pressure cuffs, we didn't think of hypertension as a medical problem. You could argue that until we invented Viagra, we didn't think of erectile dysfunction as a medical problem. When we have the technology, it feeds back and results in a definition, redefinition of something that was formerly not seen as a part of medical care. Baldness, for example or short stature, or acne, or infertility used to be just seen as a misfortune. It wasn't seen as a medical problem, but with the invention of technologies to respond to infertility, it becomes medicalized. 
Road rage or child abuse used to be seen as a moral failing. It wasn't seen as a kind of uh, clinical problem. Substance use, gambling, we now speak of gambling addiction. Poverty is increasingly becoming medicalized and the topic we'll return to. Or gun violence, also a topic we will return to. And formerly, many of these may have been understood as different kinds of deviance. They may have been seen as problems of law or crime, or religion or sin or moral failing, or of medicine and illness. And some of them, in fact, may actually be culture-bound syndromes. Some of these things that you and I might talk about as if you know they are actually medical problems, others might look at them and say, no, that's the social standard. You're constructing that. You're saying that that is a disease, even though it might not be. So medical medicalization is the progressive annexation of not illness into illness. As sociologist Renee Fox has put it in her terrific essay on this topic, health and illness have come to symbolize many positively and negatively valued biological, physical, social, cultural, and metaphysical phenomena. Increasingly, health is coming to be seen as a coded way of referring to any ideal state of affairs. So think about the metaphoric use of the word health in our society. The way we talk about health of institutions or health of uh, our, our society as a whole. Health, you see, has always, but increasingly, is seen through a kind of a moral uh, lens. These medicalized conditions, in fact, I would argue, are also part of the health transition. It may even be the case that as mortality has declined over the last hundred years, and as doctors, in some sense, have had much less to do, there has been a compensating rise in medicalization. Because, in fact, we might still need doctors. Thank you. So next time, uh, we'll continue from that. Are there any questions today? Any logistic questions? Any intellectual questions? Yes. Okay. Stella, I think, is your name. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. I'm going to try to learn as many of your names as I can. <laughs> you have to help me. OK, so ideally, you'll, you'll forgive me if I Forgive me if I don't remember your names, if, even though you've asked questions many times, and especially forgive me if I confuse you, which I guarantee I'll do. Yes. Um, Susie. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, could you just briefly like, retouch on what qualities were? I wasn't completely clear on that. OK, so qualities, qualities are quality-adjusted life years. So we say you could have one year in perfect health or two years in half perfect health. So those would be identical states, quality adjusted life years. So what, what happens here is that you use the health or the utilities on the y-axis, and you have a certain number of years. You can integrate the area under these curves. You integrate the gray. You add up all the quality, each quality under the gray, and that's the total amount of qualities you have left if you're the gray guy versus the blue guy. I'm sure others had that question. Uh, what's your name? Uh, Srija. Srija? Yes. Uh-huh. That's a very good distinction. Sometimes they did exist and were then redefined and annexed into medicine. Sometimes they didn't even exist at all, or weren't seen as medical problems. That's right. Very good. Other questions? Yeah. Going back to the like But that would be the same as the depression and morbidity. Okay. So he's drawing distinctions. He's saying, look, because all that's happening is we're postponing diagnosis, and people live five years after the onset of disease. Uh, so it's just a postponement of diagnosis without any shift to the right. Or is it both? Now, they're not mutually exclusive. Multiple of those things could happen. But he says, look, there are different ways of thinking about what's happening. We're, we're affecting the incidence of disease. And we'll return to this idea, actually, in a couple of weeks next lecture. Uh, and we could also be postponing that. How do we assess the relative merits of all of them? All right.
Uh, come and see me after the team. We want to see you guys next time.